to the network to for in order to fulfill that phone call. We can do something a little bit similar by isolating bands of spectrum and parts of the network for individual use cases. This slide, you see things like base services. So one of the things that I do at 5G Labs is I work on a project at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar where we're testing a number. You might have, if you've seen the movie Top Gun, you know what that base is. Um, but we're testing a number of different use cases for 5G around this exact thing that I'm describing, things that are very different from each other and have very different techniques. Austin and London. Each one focuses on a different aspect of 5G. Um, LA is pretty cool in that it has our, our sports facility in it, so we're using 5G to do analytics on how athletes um, perform in a practice environment and then also develop through further training. But we also do things around music and entertainment. DC is a little different in that I focus, I run our DC lab where I focus primarily on smart cities and first response technologies. I think I kind of just touched on that and the next slide. I really owe everyone here a huge congratulations on surviving your first G, your first 5G uh, lecture in education class. So um, I'll be here for a while. I'll take any questions afterwards because I don't know we're really limited on time. I want to hand things over to Nagla. But um, please feel free to reach out. My first name, dot last name, Dominic dot Bonaducci at Verizon.com. I probably give that out because I know none of you will be able to spell it off the top of your hand, but I'll give it to you afterwards, no problem. Thanks, Dominic. Thank you. This week, because of that, I have to get a 5G. You got to get a 5G. So now I'm on the 5G <laughs> network. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Italian, I assume, right? I am Italian. I have an Italian last name. I am uh, more Mexican than anything else. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So you speak Italian and Spanish? I, it's shameful. I speak neither. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. This is great, and uh, I'm sure um, with these with these projects like this, you know, it's bringing to Maryland, especially, you know, to mm -hmm. build the uh, the five G technology, and mm -hmm. with with Jaime Paniagua, who's directly involved in that kind of projects, you know, it's exciting to see how the small businesses again are going to take advantage of, of, of the infrastructure that is going to be built, you know, to, to build these networks. Yeah, and I didn't touch on it too much because you know I'm not. I'm not a salesperson when it comes to selling 5G and, and putting that stuff out there. I explore the use cases, but um, 
what small businesses will immediately be able to take advantage of first is going to be your fixed wireless access. It's, it's going to be getting access to commercial internet, much like you would at home, mm -hmm. um, but without having to be limited to where your Verizon service is. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have to have, you know, wait a month for them to run fiber to my building. I can access it over 5G. And that's going to unlock things from processing payments if you run a storefront um, to just running your construction office. So no more last mile issues. No more last mile issues. That's the that's the dream. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's exciting stuff. Thank you so much. No, so now we're going to move to the possibility of having the fastest train in the world. Yeah. <laughs> well, instead of like, you know, the, the notion of planes, trains, and automobiles, we're, <laughs> we're going on, you know, automobiles, broadband, and super trains, right? <laughs> in that aspect. That's the, the, the theme of today in that aspect. But certainly, well, by the way, correct, before I go to our next guest speaker, uh, you know, you said your bio was real outdated, but is this outdated? Um, that you were uh, Time Magazine's person of the year? In 2007. Yeah. Yeah. So Google it. <laughs> <laughs> that year it said, it had a mirror on it, and it said you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where you found that bio. That is an old we dug it in. Hey, I use 5G to find it. <laughs> so, our next guest speaker, and I hopefully I say your first name right, Ian, Ian, yeah. Ian Rainey, uh, is, uh, serves as the Senior Vice President at the Northeast Magnet, yep. uh, which is formed to uh, promote high-speed rail solutions in the Northeast Corridor using JR Central Superconducting Magnet technology. So, that's a, a, a mouthful there, but certainly... Uh, I uh, look forward to your presentation and thank you for being one of our guests. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, RG and to the Chamber so much for the opportunity to uh, talk to you. And um, I have a short presentation. I just would like to uh, uh, bring everybody up to speed on our efforts to bring uh, this train, so this is the superconducting maglev train, uh, to the Northeast Corridor to connect Washington, D.C. and New York, but with the first segment between uh, DC and Baltimore. So before I dive in, let me just make an important point. Uh, what you're looking at here, this is an actual photograph of the train that is operating today in Japan, uh, west of Tokyo. And that's, I think, really important um, because when a lot of people think about high-speed rail or they hear things like maglev, they say, oh, well, does that really exist, or is it a concept, or a prototype, or is it like a hyperloop thing or something? And the answer is no, it's none of those things. It is an actual train that is running today in Japan at 300 miles per hour. In fact, uh, Governor Hogan has ridden the train with his wife, I think, on the same visit uh, after South Korea that you mentioned. I believe he went to Japan and rode the train in 2015 with his wife. Uh, we've had numerous delegations over there. so. I guess what I'm trying to say or emphasize is that this train really exists, unlike a lot of other train technologies that we have been hearing about uh, quite a bit in the last few years. Um, so I have a short video on the next slide. Uh, hopefully we are 5G enabled and this will play uh, without any difficulty. We didn't know we needed a faster horse until someone gave us a faster horse. We didn't know we needed to travel through the air or across the sea or beyond the sky until someone showed us we did. These noble pursuits, the ones that take visionary leaders and leaps of faith, those are the ones that carry us by leaps and bounds into the future. We may not know we needed the world's fastest train, because we don't realize it's much more than a fast train. It will redefine geography and bring distant cities radically closer together. To travel from New York Washington, D.C. in just an hour's time changes the dynamics of where and how we live. It means waking up in Georgetown and going to work in Midtown. It means that millions of commuter hours can be reclaimed and spent more valuably. And ideas, leadership, and talent can be nimble enough to leap from city to city in mere minutes, allowing us to travel as fast as our ambitions. It's not just a train. It's thousands of new infrastructure jobs, the likes of which hasn't been seen in decades. By uniting a region that makes up the fifth largest economy in the world, this train will unlock tremendous potential, driving growth, 
opportunity and commerce at every station stop. This isn't just a train. It's an opportunity for America to take a quantum leap forward through a future of travel and create a legacy for generations to come. We may not know we need it today, but once we take that leap, Wow, I got the chills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> so if we could go to the next Oops. slide. We didn't know that. We can watch it again. There you go. Um, <laughs> so before I dive in, let me I'll just say a couple words about who we are. Um, for folks who are following the project, and, and some of you may have heard about it or are following it, others are not, and that's, that's fine. But there's a couple of different private companies involved in the Magma project. and. Uh, I get a lot of questions about, are you the same company? Are you competitors? So um, the first company that's involved in this project is called BWRR, Baltimore, Washington Rapid Rail. That's, that's like the project developer. That's the entity that's going to raise the financing for the project. It'll oversee construction, and then it'll oversee the operation and maintenance of the system. I'm a part of BWRR. Uh, uh, that, but, that's basically, that's the railroad. It's the developer and it's gonna become the railroad. Northeast Maglev, and I'm kind of wearing my Northeast Maglev hat tonight, uh, is sort of the company that does public relations and marketing, uh, lobbying, consulting. So there's a bunch of reasons why we created two different companies, but anyway, it's basically the same people, the same mission and the same project. What's really important is that we're all closely aligned uh, with Central Japan Railway Company. And that's that's the that's the company in Japan that has developed this maglev system, uh, and they provide us with consulting services, uh, technical expertise, advice, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but they don't own us. We are American-owned companies. Uh, JR Central uh, is there to help us with the technology, help us make sure that we're designing the system correctly. Uh, so we're very closely partnered with them. Uh, for anyone who's ever been to Japan. Chances are you have ridden on one of JR Central's trains. They actually operate the world's first high-speed rail system, uh, which was built in 1964. Uh, it's the world's uh, oldest high-speed rail system. It connects Tokyo to Nagoya to Osaka using the really iconic bullet train. And uh, that is the busiest high-speed rail system in the world. They move 150 million passengers per year. Um, this is an astonishing fact, uh, but it is absolutely true. The average delay per train over the course of an entire year on that system, and remember they move 150 million people per year, the average delay per year is less than 30 seconds, and that includes massive earthquakes. So yeah. in terms of service and reliability, uh, it is the gold standard in high-speed rail in the world. So we're very privileged uh, to have them as our technical partner and technology provider. Uh, the reason for Maglev is that that bullet train system, it is absolutely a capacity. They cannot add more trains to that system. Uh, but the demand in Japan is growing. Uh, notwithstanding the fact people say, well, Japan's population is getting older and declining. Uh, overall, that's absolutely true. But between Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka, it's actually increasing pretty dramatically. And so they need a new system. And, and they foresaw that uh, over half a century ago. They knew that their bullet train would just reach capacity at some point. And they started thinking very early on about, well, how are we going to deal with that in 50 years' time or 75 years' time? And they actually adopted an American uh, technology, superconducting maglev. And I'll explain a little bit what that is in a minute. Uh, they started trying to figure out how can we turn this into a really cutting edge transportation system. Uh, and they have come a long way and they're actually now running this train uh, in Japan, west of uh, Tokyo, and they're going to connect it uh, all the way from Tokyo to Nagoya uh, very soon, 2027. Next slide. Uh, a question we get asked pretty often, and I think it's very legitimate, is, uh, you know, Maglev, Sounds really cool, but you know, why do we need it? The corridor already has Amtrak Acela. It has the Northeast Regional Train. And we have all the commuter lines. We have uh, MARC, we have uh, SEPTA, uh, New Jersey Transit, uh, DRE, all these things. 
our answer to that is all of those systems are critical. MART is an absolutely critical system in Maryland. There's no doubt about it. And Amtrak is vitally important. But the bottom line is that they're just not enough. Our, 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 our friends from MDOT gave a presentation about growth in population, mm -hmm. growth in jobs in Maryland. Uh, if you look at the entire corridor, it, it's really astonishing how many more people, uh, uh, you know, forecasters are predicting are going to live in the corridor. 12 million additional residents in the Northeast Corridor by 2040, and nearly 5 million additional jobs. And, uh, you know, if you're a frequent user, say, of Amtrak to go visit family in New York, like I am, um, it, it, it just doesn't work. A Amtrak Acela runs once an hour. And that's okay, but that's not enough to accommodate that kind of growth in this corridor. And the Northeast Corridor is the economic backbone of the United States. And if, if we're going to keep pace in this modern world and make sure that we maintain mm -hmm. kind of our pre preeminent economic position, we need better mobility in the corridor. Mm -hmm. and, and we really need something in addition to uh, the existing commuter lines and Amtrak. And we think the solution that we need on the corridor is Maglev. Next slide. So uh, what we're proposing is a, a Maglev system that will connect Washington, D.C. to New York, along with the major cities and airports uh, between those two uh, terminal stations. Uh, and it would travel at a speed of 311 miles per hour. That's kind of the cruising speed of the system. Uh, it actually it's able to achieve speeds close to 400 miles per hour, but the cruising speed is 300 miles per hour. And at that speed, you would get from Baltimore to Washington in 15 minutes, and from Baltimore to New York in 45 minutes. Or total, if you're traveling, say, from Washington, D.C. to New York in under an hour. And that would include two stops uh, along the way, and we would keep alternating the stops. So we'd be launching, say, eight trains an hour if you're getting, say, on board the train in Baltimore at 9 a.m., maybe that train stops at Wilmington in Newark. And if you're getting on the train 10 minutes later, maybe that train is going to be stopping in Philadelphia Airport in Philadelphia. So it would all be based on the travel dynamics. It would be kind of a tailored operating plan. But the bottom line is, over the course of an hour, you'll be able to get anywhere in the Northeast Corridor uh, in under 60 minutes. Um, that's a game changer. I mean, if you take Amtrak right now, it's two hours, 45 minutes. And again, I'm not here to knock Amtrak. I, I love Amtrak. And I think Amtrak does an amazing job. Uh, they, but they have severe constraints on what they're able to do. And um, uh, if you drive uh, between, say, DC and New York, that's, that's four or five hours. Uh, if you fly, you know, that's short, but um, you've got to get to your airport. And then once you land, you you've got to get from the airport to downtown or wherever you're going. Mm -hmm. So that's three hours. So Maglev is like city center to city center all under an hour. Did somebody have a question? Yeah. So Amtrak. Yes. Uh, this is a replacement system for Amtrak? No, not on at all. Same tracks or on the same tracks used or new tunnels, new ways? New no. Ways? Uh, so actually, can we go to the next slide? So the way the system works is Maglev cannot operate on a regular railroad track. So this has to be completely new. Uh, so we, we are proposing a completely new right of way. Uh, we will not be operating on Amtrak tracks. And actually, we have no intention whatsoever of this being a replacement for Amtrak. The idea would be that this would be an ultra high speed option. Uh, Amtrak makes a lot of stops between Washington, D.C. and New York. Maglev would not make that many stops, but it would get you to your destination much, much more quickly. So if you want to go to New Carrollton and you want to stop and, you know, uh, I'm drawing a blank, say, on some intermediate stop in Pennsylvania, Amtrak is, is probably the best option for you. If you're really concerned about, say, getting to a business meeting in Philadelphia or New York as quickly as possible, Maglev is going to be the option. It will be like a uh, little you know, faster than the plane. By the time you go to the airport, it's oh, it, it'll be it'll be three times faster than a plane. Yeah, yeah because the plane, <coughs> for example, if you want to uh, fly 
to, uh, from say Washington DC to New York, you would have to go to National Airport, check your bags, wait in security, uh, and then wait for, you have to be at your gate, you know, a half hour before your plane leaves, and then you're, on, you're in the air or on the tarmac, and then on, on the other end for an hour, and then you have to pick up your bags, get in a taxi, and get downtown. So that's three hours easily. This would be one hour, so. Yeah. And, and how, how, how long would this project would take to implement? I'll get to that. I'll get to that. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, when do we start? <laughs> well, the one thing that probably as an engineer, you know, building this, and I picture that it has to be flat and straight, right? Yes. Yeah, it has to, be, to reach those uh, speeds. Exactly. Right? So because the train is so fast, we can't have sharp curves, otherwise everyone's going to be stuck to the side of the train or spilling their coffee or something like this. So it has to be pretty straight, um, and that's challenging mm -hmm. because if we could take sharp curves, there's a lot of roads and railroad lines, and we could kind of hug those, uh, but we can't. We have to be relatively straight. So that imposes some constraints uh, on actually where we can locate the, the, the right-of-way for the project. And I'll show a little bit uh, currently what our concept is. But, but before we do that, let me just explain really quickly how the system works. So I'm not an engineer, but um, basically if you really reduce temperatures to an extremely, extremely low level uh, and have a magnet, you'll virtually eliminate electrical resistance and you can you can create this incredibly powerful magnetic force so what we do is we embed these super cooled magnets in the side of the train and we have these coils electrical coils alongside what we call the guideway wall and we put a current through these electrical coils and it creates a magnetic field with this embedded magnet and because it's so cold uh, the magnet is super cool because there's no electrical resistance the magnetic force is incredible and it's able to lift up this huge train and move it at an incredibly high speed so we have two types of coils uh, levitation coils and propulsion coils and because there's no elect because there's no uh, friction because we're not relying on steel wheels on rails we're able to have these incredibly high speeds because there, there's there's really so no basically the, the system's not touching it's on the air it's like floating it's floating so it's like it's almost like an airplane on the ground yeah, yeah. Okay. next slide um so our our, our colleagues from MDOT talked a, little, a bit about the environmental process that they're going through we're going through exactly the same thing for this project there's a EIS environmental impact statement process it's a process uh, we're working very closely with MDOT. MDOT is actually the lead agency for it in the state. Uh, and there's a federal lead agency, which is the Federal Railroad Administration. They're jointly leading the EIS process because that's a, that's a government regulatory process. And that EIS process is looking at two alternatives uh, for the maglev. And in the back, it might be, we'll share these slides, of course. It might be a little bit difficult to see, but the concept would be that we would have a station in Washington, D.C. We would be in tunnel, and the dotted line here is tunnel. Hmm. And then around Greenbelt, we would come up above ground, and we would be on a viaduct, an elevated viaduct. And we have two alternatives. One, this is the uh, Baltimore-Washington Parkway. One of our alternatives is proposed to be on the east side of the Baltimore-Washington Parkway, elevated. And the other one is on the west side, of the Baltimore Washington Parkway also elevated and there's various pros and cons uh, to either of those they look so similar on this map but on the ground they're dramatically different uh, then we would go back into tunnel we would go underneath BWI Airport so right now if you travel to BWI Airport uh, on, on the train it's a little bit uh, inconvenient because you, you have to get off the train and then you have to get onto kind of a shuttle bus that will take you over to the airport. And that can take time. Uh, we're working with uh, the airport management. Uh, we have a really strong, very uh, uh, constructive relationship with them. 
to actually site the maglev underneath the main concourse area so that you would get off the maglev, you could go up and you would be right there where all of the gates are. Incredibly convenient. Yeah. And then we continue uh, in tunnel uh, to Baltimore. And there's, there's two station options in Baltimore that are being looked at. One is in the downtown uh, Inner Harbor area near Camden Yards. And one is a little bit further south on the South Branch. Um, I guess one of the main things I would point out is that about 70% of this project is proposed to be in tunnel. Uh, for anyone here who's involved in engineering, you know, you, you probably can guess, tunnel is a lot, lot more mm -hmm. expensive than mm -hmm. building above the grade. Mm -hmm. uh, we did that very deliberately because these areas outside of Washington, around BWI and Baltimore, they're so densely residential that the, the only way we could have constructed them would be to have to you know, go through residential neighborhoods, uh, acquire residential properties. And, um, it, it, it just, I don't think the project could have happened uh, if we had to do that. So although it's more expensive to be in tunnel, uh, we made kind of a strategic decision that most of this project would be on the ground. Next slide. Uh, so the, the gentleman asked about, so what's the schedule? And that, that's a great question. Uh, right now, we're in this EIS and permitting phase with, with our colleagues at Maryland DOT and Federal Road Administration. Uh, a draft of that EIS document was released earlier this year in January. Uh, there was a public comment period. Maybe some of the folks here uh, it, were able to listen in uh, to some of those public hearings or provided comments, which is, is wonderful if you did, thank you. Uh, the comment period wrapped up in May, and now the Federal Railroad Administration uh, is gonna have to process all of those comments, and um, they'll publish then a final environmental impact statement, and then I'll identify a preferred route, a preferred Baltimore station, facilities, locations, blah, blah, blah. Once that happens, uh, in principle, then we will be able to go into our final design, which for a project like this is going to be, you know, a lot of money and take a bit of time. Um, probably two, a year and a half, two years for final design to do all of that engineering to 100% engineering design level. And then we'll be able to start construction. So if we can complete the EIS in 2022, uh, and then say allow two years uh, for all of our final permitting, uh, kind of local permitting, fire code permitting, building permits, and all that kind of stuff. Um, we should be in a position, I hope, to begin construction in 2024. Uh, yes, ma'am. Do you have to address the power grid? Uh, yes, and, and actually we're pretty deep into discussions with BG&E and PEPCO uh, we're also looking at uh, whether or not we can uh, use renewables. We're coming up with a concept plan uh, to uh, at least power some of the maglev uh, using renewable energy, wind energy. Um, that's still pretty conceptual, but uh, we will be relying on the PJM uh, grid uh, to power the system. And, um, you know, those discussions are underway with the providers. Um, once construction starts, it'll last probably seven to 10 years, uh, and that will vary depending on some of the decisions that are made in the EIS process. Uh, for example, one of our station locations in Baltimore, one of the options is underground. Uh, another option is above ground. An underground station obviously is a lot more complicated. It takes more time to construct and so forth. So, Depending on some of the decisions made in the EIS, that will drive the length, the construction duration. Um, but, um, you know, seven to 10 years, and then we will be able to begin revenue service. So that might seem like pretty far away, but, you know, when you consider a project that's, you know, 40 miles of linear infrastructure, a lot of it in deep tunnel, uh, large board diameter tunnel, uh, which is relatively uncommon in the United States. Uh, it's actually a fairly aggressive timeline. Next slide. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the benefits of the project. I, I won't belabor it because I know we're a little pressed for time, but one of the things that we see as a really major, major benefit of the project 
is not just the fact that you can get, say, from Baltimore to Washington in 15 minutes, but it also is going to improve your commute if you continue to rely on your automobile. And the reason for that is that our target market for the SC Magla is actually automobile. It, it, it's, we're, we're not trying to steal Mark's riders. We're not trying to steal Amtrak's riders. Of course, some of them will be diverted to Magla, but really, the bulk of our ridership is coming from auto. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, we're looking, and, and these are estimates that were prepared by the Federal Railroad Administration, uh, we're looking at a reduction in regional vehicle miles traveled of about 12%, which is given the volume of automobile travel that we have in Maryland in the district, it's one of the most congested areas in the country, as I'm sure our colleagues can attest, that's a really significant reduction to the tune of up to 16.4 million fewer uh, automobile trips each year uh, because those passengers will be diverted to Magla. Uh, next slide. Um, also, you know, needless to say, this is an expensive project. Uh, civil works alone are going to be in excess of $10 billion. Uh, so that includes construction of the tunnels, the stations, the viaducts. Um, and there are going to be other costs for the system itself, uh, for system integration, for soft costs, all these kinds of things. Uh, but from the, the, the civil construction cost alone of the project, the Department of Transportation is estimating that that's going to create 123,000 jobs. Actually, let me be very specific. It's going to create 123,000 job years. Mm -hmm. So that's one person for one job for one year. Uh, those are construction jobs. It's also forecast to create 38,000 professional service jobs during construction. So those are service jobs that are not construction jobs. So things like, uh, say, uh, uh, design work, uh, architectural work, uh, IT type services, uh, anything not actual bread and butter construction, uh, that's 38,000 professional services jobs during the construction period. Uh, this doesn't even factor in the tail end, which is that once the system is up and running, of course we will need uh, people operating and maintaining it you know, for, for, for decades to come. So it, it really is a huge boost uh, to the regional job market. And of course, you know, that results in employee earnings and Federal Railroad Administration is estimating $8.8 .8 billion in employee earnings. And that money presumably then gets reinvested into the local economy. So it's a tremendous, tremendous stimulus to uh, local GDP, regional GDP. Next slide. Uh, so, uh, another important point that, uh, Who's that guy? I don't know, this is some very handsome guy. Uh, really likes Magla. It's like he maybe So, this is something we're really uh, proud of and excited about. And um, uh, this is from an event. This photograph is actually from an event in Annapolis, I think, back in February, where the company um, uh, unveiled some early, these are kind of preliminary goals uh, that we've set for ourselves. And I say goals because, or preliminary, because I actually imagine these numbers are gonna be somewhat higher, but you know, we, need to, we need to kind of manage expectations. But uh, what, 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 we, what we released uh, back in February was that our goal is to fill 25% of permanent uh, jobs in Maryland uh, with people of color and women, and 40% of construction-related jobs in Maryland uh, would go to people of color and women. And in terms of overall kind of business opportunities in the state of Maryland, the goal is for 25% of the project spend on construction to be in Maryland, and 25% of the project spend on operations in Maryland. And one of the questions we get is, well, you know, most of the projects in Maryland, you know, why isn't that number higher? The reason that number is not higher is because a lot of the materials we need, like concrete, like steel, those are actually being sourced from outside of the state. Uh, so, it, you know, that kind of skews the numbers a little bit. But the actual construction jobs, the construction companies that are going to be building this system are going to be Maryland and Washington, D.C. companies. Next slide. In terms of career opportunities, I mean, I won't go into all this. I think some of these are probably very obvious to you. But one of the things that I would really emphasize about career opportunities for the MAGLEV is that 
these are pretty, some of these jobs, you know, many of these jobs are going to be kind of standard jobs. They're going to be construction jobs that we're all kind of used to and familiar with, but many of them are going to be pretty unique jobs. A lot of the software involved in the system is very, very unique to the system. The operation of the system, the maintenance of these, you know, superconducting magnets and bogies and coils. I mean, this is unlike anything that anyone has really ever done in the United States before. So we're going to actually have to invest in training a workforce in the district in Maryland that's going to be able to operate and maintain the system. So one of the things that we're doing now really aggressively is going out to local communities, uh, local community colleges, local universities, educational facilities, and stuff like that, um, and trying to you know get people excited about this and figure out how we can partner with some of those institutions to kind of build up the MAGLED workforce for the future. Next slide. Uh, I apologize for the slide, it's, it's a little busy, I, I, so I won't spend too much time on it, but what we try to do, and we'll share this with everybody, of course, is sort of figure out what are the main categories of types of jobs uh, that we would anticipate for a system like this, you know, not just during construction, uh, but, you know, during uh, actual operation, and, and sort of assigning some years of, you know, when we're going to be seeking those types to fill those types of jobs, so you can see some of the stuff you know, it, it's coming up pretty soon. I mean, we're already in the phase of doing geotechnical. We've done hundreds of geotechnical borings already, and we're doing, uh, you know, a lot of preliminary design work is going to be starting next year. So it's really moving pretty quickly. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's going to be a really broad range, broad spectrum of jobs that we're going to need to fill uh, to, to make this project a reality. Next slide. Uh, that wraps it up, and actually this uh, photograph that you're looking at, this is the latest uh, design of the maglev that was actually just unveiled in Japan. Uh, it's the same, the inside of the train is all different, but they kind of changed the, the paint scheme and stuff like that. But So this is kind of the, the latest and greatest uh, photo of the maglev that is now operating in Japan and that we hope to bring to uh, Baltimore, Washington very soon. So thank you very much. How many? It's a, it's a great question. In Japan, so uh, let me answer that first by saying we need to build this system the way it's going to be when it's operating all the way to New York. And that's a little tricky because that means we need a really long train set. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to start off with the length of train set that we're going to be using for New York. And that's a 16 car train set, which is like twice the length of say a metro train. And the reason for that is because unlike a regular train where you could just you know add cars to it or whatever, there's all kinds of technical issues with maglev. Uh, the end cars are configured a little differently and you have transponder locations and stuff like that. So we can't like start out with a nine car train and then bump it up to 12 and then go to 16. In order to do that, we have to shut the system down for months at a time and that's just probably not tenable. So we're starting out with a 16 car train. The answer to your question is, I don't know. I can tell you in Japan, they're assuming they'll be able to have, I think about uh, 800 to 900 passengers on a 16 car train set. However, there's a couple factors in the United States uh, that suggest we probably won't have that many people. One is that Americans are bigger than Japanese. Uh, and that's just a fact. Uh, there's a lot of statistics on this. Mm -hmm. More muscular. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Americans are, are bigger uh, and they need more space, uh, what, what we call seat pitch. So that's a factor. The other factor <clears throat> is that uh, we have to figure out how we're going to handle uh, very uh, strict and, and very good requirements for Americans with Disabilities. And mm -hmm. our ADA requirements, they're called Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that the train is accessible uh, to our passengers that do have disabilities. Uh, but with that, there's a lot of work to be done mm -hmm. on things like emergency evacuation for those mm -hmm. passengers and toilet facilities for those passengers. So. Just to give you an example, in Japan, uh, there's like uh, only a handful of toilets on the cars. 
in the United States, typically for inner city passenger rail, you're required to have a restroom facility that's ADA compliant on every car. Mm. And that takes up a lot of area that otherwise would be for seating. Mm. So this is a long discussion we're gonna have with the Department of Transportation and, and a very important one, because again, you know, we want to accommodate all those passengers that we can, uh, but it will impact the number of seats. So it'll be less than the 800 or so that they have in Japan. Question? Just a quick question. I know we're about 12, 13 years from this. Yep. So you probably don't know the price point or the cost of this, but compare, in comparison to the other component services, yes. what's that that difference increase? Maybe you'll accept Bitcoin by then. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll see about Bitcoin. I don't know about that, but uh, it, so we actually have looked really uh, closely at cost, and um, there's been a lot of so there are opponents to this project. I'll be very upfront about that, and that's fine. And and we value their input, and we try and uh, engage with our opponents, you know, and, and understand their concerns, and try and figure out ways to address them. Uh, one of the unfortunate untruths. That has been put out there, you know, uh, deliberately or not, is that the Maglev train is going to cost eighty dollars, and it's going to be designed to take rich lawyers from Washington D.C. to, you know, games at Camden Yards. Fal that false. It's false. Okay. Eighty to New York or eighty to Baltimore? To Baltimore. Oh. And that's just, it's it's not true. What we did. So when you do these transportation type studies. Mm -hmm. What you're trying to figure out is, you know, what is people's value of time? How much are they willing to pay for an extra minute, an extra two minutes, an extra 15 minutes, an extra hour? So you kind of come up with a pretty wide range of price points and you figure out like, okay, you know, are there people who are willing to pay $80? And the truth is that there are, right? If you're a business traveler and you are late to uh, catch an airplane because you, you need to get to BWI for a business meeting somewhere you know, in another city, and you buy your ticket five minutes before your train leaves, you might be willing to pay $80, right? I imagine that's probably very enticing when you compare it to like, I'm running last minute, you know, last minute flight to BWI, I lived in DC and it's raining, and surge pricing now yeah. has that as $150. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And an Uber but, ride. A new variety about 50, 60 dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that most of our tickets are going to be probably in the 20, 30, maybe 40 dollar range. And um, people say, well, gosh, that still sounds like a lot because like mark tickets are eight dollars to go from Baltimore to Washington. But I would make a couple of points about that. Mark is great, but mark is a slower commuter service, right? And so you pay for speed, you pay for that value of time. So it is more Good expensive. Mm -hmm. And Mark is subsidized. Like so um, <laughs> although it may seem uh, inexpensive when you're paying at the fare box, taxpayers are actually paying. Mm -hmm. So it is coming up, you know. So there are, and, and I think there's great reasons why Mark should be subsidized. I, I completely agree with it. but. To be clear, a mark ticket is not really eight um, dollars. So this, you know, it, there, this we're, we're going to employ variable pricing. If you buy your ticket, say you buy a monthly pass, or your company offers you a monthly pass, or you know that you're going to be taking your kids to the aquarium in a week, and you buy your ticket ahead of time, you're probably going to be paying closer to that twenty-five dollar range. Uh, but if you're that business person rushing to the airport at the peak of the peak of rush hour, you'll pay a premium for that. Well, I mean, you can get a salary from New York and live in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it, That's yeah. Not very attractive. Yeah. yeah. It, it, I mean, it, it's, it really it changes the way I think people think about where to live, right? And um, you know, there's all kind. Of, I, I I work in D.C. Although our main office is in Baltimore, but um, you know, there's so many dynamics right now underway in those cities. I mean, there's a there's there is a, an affordable housing crisis in Washington D.C. right now, mm -hmm. and Baltimore has lost five percent of its population. Mm -hmm. So, if you introduce maglev, and, and that the five percent population loss, I mean, 
that that's kind of new information that just came out yep. think, about a month ago, but it's astonishing uh, the drop in population mm -hmm. in the course of the year. But if you could travel between those two cities in 15 minutes, I mean, you would go a long way towards solving both of those problems because there's much more affordable housing in Baltimore. It would in incentivize people to live in Baltimore, mm -hmm. and it would help solve DC's affordable housing crisis. So, so that question for you. Yep. Uh, so you said that this project is going to take completion between 7 to 10 years. For uh, construction. Yeah. Right. Yes. So um, between that period, is there going to be sectional uh, sections that are going to be operated? Yes. Uh, no, 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 no. No, there's not. It, it, DC to Baltimore. Is yeah. Like so the system has to be completely built and then tested. And it has to be tested as a total system. So we, we can't. Yeah, it, th this is, it's a little bit different approach to kind of trains, but the, the Japanese approach to trains is it is a total system. It is completely integrated. Um, you can't you can't build a piece, operate it, and then kind of go. Everything is synchronized. So the operations at the maintenance facility are synchronized with the operations at the terminal station. And, uh, it, and that is why the Japanese are able to run trains with an annual delay of less than 30 seconds and they've never had an accident in 60 years because it's a total system but we have to build it as a total system and then test it and certify it as a total system so we can't just build a piece run it <laughs> but you'll be able to DC the build phase one yes to DC to Baltimore DC to Baltimore yep. completely completely and then move on yep. to the yes, next yes 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 so we'll, we'll we'll operate DC Baltimore okay. that'll start revenue service okay. in seven to ten years yeah okay. and then we'll move on but we can't do like no I don't do that we, we can't do something we can't do like <laughs> you know a section and Anne Arundel and see if it yeah, no, no, that was what I was referring to yes uh, okay. city to city yeah, yep. city to city yes city to city will be operational for ticket uh, ticketed passengers in seven to ten years. And what is the noise level? Uh, it's actually very low. The main noise producer uh, on a conventional train is the pantograph. It's the thing that sticks up out of the top of the train and connects to the electrical wire. Mm -hmm. That creates that kind of screeching noise. Uh, we don't have that and we don't have any wheels, so there's no uh, screeching uh, wheel sound. So there is a, it's interesting, there, there is a uh, um, noise, but it's very short because the train goes by so quickly. So unlike, say, a metro train, which you know you can stand there and you hear it, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it. Maglev, if I'm standing here, uh, the train passes me in just a matter of seconds, unlike a regular train. So there's all kinds of different ways that we mitigate noise with tunnels, uh, with hoods, with things, sound barriers, and things like this, but, you know, uh, say we have a noise wall and you're 25 feet away from the wall, maybe for like three seconds it's 70 dB or something like that. So you mentioned like some of the, the design stuff that's already started, like you started doing geotechnical warrants. So like so, how does a DBE firm get involved, like we're a geotechnical firm, yeah. like how do we connect with Northeast Maglev or what was it, the uh, BWRR? Right. And, and so, you know, the, so the, the geotech that we have done has been really uh, limited, and, and it was we did enough geotech that was necessary for the environmental impact statement. So it was a fairly small boring program. Um, the boring program for uh, the full boring program for a project like this is going to be pretty huge, you know, because it is so tunnel intensive. So what, you know, I think what you could do is uh, give me your contact information or email us. Mm -hmm. uh, we do keep kind of a registry of uh, firms that have expressed interest. And what will happen is uh, once we do really begin the preliminary engineering in earnest, once we're mm -hmm. kind of through most of the, you know, difficulties of the EIS and kind of figuring mm -hmm. out what the preferred alternative. Because what we don't want to do is do a bunch of uh, borings and then realize a different alternative is selected. Uh, but we'll start having open houses for industry and mm -hmm. stuff like that, uh, where people can come in to kind of hear about specific contracting opportunities. And will you have like pre-planned stuff, like percentage percentage phase for DBEs? Because like obviously like 
and all the small firms are not going to be like, yes, we've worked on the mag lab. Or how, like, we have limited, more limited experience, more limited capabilities. So there's obviously stuff that's on the simpler side. Because you're going to go to the bigger firms like the, who've done massive transportation. Like, a small 20-person company can't say, yes, we've done multi-billion dollar project. But you've done pieces here and there. That haven't done it. It's like, yeah. so do you guys have a plan? Or are you just going to figure out how to, how to like, so, I mean, incorporate the company. device? Yeah, I mean, yeah, actually, the, the company that we used to do well. our initial uh, boring program uh, was a very small company, a minority-owned company. So one of the things that they're doing is uh, partnering with, like, the Maryland Hispanic Chamber to be able to help them yeah. reach out to the small businesses mm -hmm. and make sure that there are programs that, you know, you guys can get on to, yeah. to be uh, along with the primes, you know, and the primes, you know, they're going to set some goals and, you know, uh, small business or minority goals that they have to be met, you know, just like, you know, a, a, an MRAP project, you know, and have the, the different percentages. And and by teaming up with, with like the Maryland Hispanic Chamber, you know, we're going to be, you know, helping and be the link to make sure that mm -hmm. the small businesses are also included <coughs> on, on, on these big projects. Yeah. Are you guys exploring any, like, mentor-protege kind of programming where, in the, in big DOD, in big federal projects, a lot of times there are um, contracts that are awarded contingent on the prime educating and assessing mm -hmm. a right. small business on mm -hmm. how to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. and I imagine that's at a very interesting point that there aren't a lot of companies that have done this before. Certainly not in the U.S. It has not been done in the U.S. Before. Mm -hmm. right. So you mentioned too that so you guys are reaching out to colleges and for training, right? Yeah. And so perhaps for the people that are here, that the ones that are interested, like him, yeah. um, you see Marco and the Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. How do you guys act on to getting to him and then out here to the people that are interested in investing uh, with the companies and the, in the training? So what do you offer that? So we're not in college, we're right here out of right. the business. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So how do we train ourselves and our companies to be ready for when the phase comes? Uh, I guess it depends on the. I guess it depends on the specific kind of skill okay. uh, that we're talking about. So, you know, if it is something like borings, you know, we don't. That borings are the same whether you're doing them in Japan or whether you're doing them here. If it's some kind of more really discreet thing, say with uh, you know uh, communications equipment for the system, you know that that's going to be we're going to have to go out to the market and find a, a company that has some kind of expertise in that, but. You know, a lot of this stuff is, and I, I don't know what kind of company you represent, but a lot of the types of things that we're talking about, the construction, the boring, mm -hmm. the engine, even the engineering, I mean, a lot of it is something that doesn't require new types of training. But some of the maintenance that we're talking about doing, like maintenance on the magnets or maintenance on the coils or on the rolling stock, that is going to require us to, you know, train people to do that because that, that capability just does not exist. So we're look, we're going to be looking to do that with college graduates because we want any, you know engineer mechanical and electrical engineers who have that type of expertise who will then come work for the company. But we're, we're also I think what we're probably going to end up doing is creating some kind of a maintenance company. Um, yeah. So I'm uh, assuming the open houses are going to be the key point for like learning a little bit more about that. And yeah. When would that be? prior to the exciting of those? Uh, I think we'll probably start having things like open houses and contractor events uh, after the EIS is over. So sometime probably late 2022, early 2023 is, is my hope. Thank you. Yeah. Great. <laughs> well, uh, it's, this is great. A lot of great information. You guys digest and get ready for this because there's going to be a lot coming. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank, you know, all three organizations are partners of the Maryland Hispanic mm -hmm. Chamber. Um, and, and we're looking forward to continue being partners and, and continue helping each other. Uh, Gabriel, anything else you want to add in terms of insurance? Uh, you want to, you know, <laughs> that, you know, some of the companies that are going to get involved on these big jobs, they're going to need some insurance, right? We were just ready, but, you know, it's uh, it's very interesting. I mean, the information we've got and, and you know, we're part of it to post it later. I think it's very interesting. As an insurance company, of course, we're ready and, and we're working with some of these contractors already, uh, you know, providing bonds and anything that they will need for these kind of projects, right? 
Um, so yeah, I mean, we're ready thank to you. enjoy that train. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, and thank you for sponsoring thank the you. event. Thank you, thank you for coming. The RNG is also a, a sponsor of the mm -hmm. chamber, and, and we're happy to have them. If you guys love cold pizza, it's back there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have some cold pizza, and there's some drinks and all that, and I really thank you for being here, and we'll, we'll do this again. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.